last meeting, right? Yes. <laughs> All right, took a while to get here, but we're finally here. We're finally here. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, our other core member, Olu, can't join us, but um, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just, I, I saw the message today, um, um, but it said, okay, we can proceed, and then we'll he'll catch up with the recording, as it said. Yeah, sounds good. So I'll get to sharing my screen. All right. Um, okay, so for the last chapter, um, we'll be covering performance um, and specifically the performance of your Shiny app, how fast it is, and how you can improve it um, in terms of its speed and identifying any bottlenecks. Um, so the goals for today will be to learn how to benchmark your app and what exactly that means, how to profile it using the Profis package, as well as a handful of techniques to optimize your code, which I think can be applicable, not just to your Shiny app, but um, I mean, a lot of them are specific to Shiny apps, but also to your code more broadly. Um, I have a small warning here. So there are a lot of, I mean, I guess throughout the textbook, there are just a lot of external links to other resources. Um, in this chapter, as with most other chapters, it's a good idea to click on them. It makes the chapter much longer than you might initially anticipate, but really expands on a lot of um, ideas to give you a better grasp of what they're talking about. So as we go throughout this chapter, I'll see if I can provide the links to those as well, because a lot of this, one, a lot of this you'll learn by doing it yourself. So rather than just listening to my lecture, um, but also um, reading other resources on these topics. And so to help keep us engaged, um, I thought I would have I'm not going to quiz anyone on the spot, but I'll put these in the chat. And so hopefully you'll be able to answer these questions by the end of the lecture, because I think these are the main things that you should grasp um, before moving on from this chapter and the rest of the book. So then we'll see at the end um, how we'll, we get each of these concepts. If not, then we can go back to review <laughs> if we need to. Um, okay. So the first section is... Um, Comparing uh, using Shiny apps to dining at a restaurant. And I like this chapter because it's full of analogies and visualizations, and that's how I learn. So at least with my Shiny app, it'll be something like Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen. Um, for those that <laughs> get the reference, um, it can be quite hectic at times. Um, but the analogy maps out in several ways. So to start the server, um, specifically for the Shiny app server, is analogous to the kitchen or restaurant. So this is at the back end, sort of where the food is prepared. The user is the customer. So they're the ones that utilize and benefit from the app's features or from the food in the kitchen. Um, they make requests or orders for specific dishes. And each R process is like a chef that prepares the food or um, in the Shiny app, um, runs whatever functions it needs. Um, to make our chefs more efficient, we might identify any slow steps um, and think of ways to make things faster and more efficient, whether that be getting better equipment or hiring more chefs. If we were to hire more chefs, so this would be analogous to getting more R processes. Um, and we could also add more kitchen equipment. So this would be, um, I guess, adding more memory to our cores or just more cores, um, period, um, can speed things up and creating more restaurants. So this would be equivalent to adding more servers um, for our app. Um, so the caveat um, or where this analogy doesn't map on perfectly is that R is single threaded. Um, this means it can only do things one at a time and not do multiple things at once. Um, unlike a chef who can prepare multiple meals at the same time. Um, however, if we did want it to be more like a chef and want not necessarily do things simultaneously, but um, to start an operation without waiting around for its results, um, we could utilize asynchronous programming. Um, and in contrast to the usual synchronous or standard R programming, um, where the caller of a function has to wait for the function to either return a result or throw an error, this allows you to serve multiple users at the same time. Um, and so they don't go into the async package but let's see, is it here? 
it's somewhere here. I'll just quickly find the link to it. Um, this should be it, or at least it, it, it talks about async. Um, so I'll put that in the chat. Okay. If you'd like to learn more about that. All right. And for the next step, um, we're going to do benchmarking. And so this is a way for us to track how does the app handle multiple users. So the first tool we're going to use is the Shiny load test package. Um, we're going to next run the app and then record um, how a user might interact with the app. Then we'll use Shiny Cat Cannon, which isn't um, in our package. Rather, it's um, something you run on your terminal um, because it uses Java and allows you to simulate how multiple users would go through your app. So you could simulate 10, 20, 100 users and see how fast it is. And then the last step is to analyze the log, which is which records um, how the sessions went and how long they took. Um, this is the code for it. And rather than go through all of this, I think let's just go through a quick example. So I'll pull up an example Shiny app and we'll see how we might want to do this. Um, at least go through the first couple of steps. I actually ran into some roadblocks. Um, and so anyone who's watching after um, or Lucy here can um, weigh in on how to resolve some problems that I'll present shortly. Um, but first, we'll just take an example app. This is just the default app um, whenever you create a Shiny app file. So it creates a histogram based on old faithful geyser data. Um, first, um, well, let's load the shiny load test package. And next we'll run the app. Okay, so as I said before, it generates a histogram um, and where you can customize the number of bins you have. And next um, to record this session. So the next thing I wanna do is record my session um, to see when I interact with the app, where is it fast? Where is it slow? Um, to do that, I will have to use, where's the code for this? The record session function. And you'll notice I can't run that here, right? Because um, my R process is currently running my Shiny app unless I stop it. So in order to get around this issue, I just have to open up another um, R Studio window. And I'll pull that up here. So now you should see my separate or second R Studio window where I can now run that function. Um, and it's important to note um, that I have to re replace this link with the one that my Shiny app gives me. Or not link. Um, yeah, whatever it's called. Uh, the hypertext protocol. And I'll have to re replace that, the one specific to my computer import. So then once I hit that or enter that, now it'll open up a second session, except this time this one is being recorded. So every time I move something, that's being recorded, the amount of time it takes, the computational efficiency. And so for any app that you have, um, you'll wanna play around with it in this recording session as if you are actually a user trying to take advantage of all of its features. So then I might adjust it a few times, explore it. Um, and once I'm done with that and I want the recording session to end, I'll just close it. And then I'll know it's closed because now it's telling me stopping server, server disconnected. Um, and the next step is to look at my recording log that's now been generated from this. So if I go into my files, should be somewhere here. And there it is, the recording log. Um, so it's a lot of incomprehensible code, at least for me. Um, 
but this will now be used um, or be inputted into Shiny Canon. And so I will not demonstrate that next step because I had a problem installing Shiny Canon. Um, I really did try my best. I even opened up a, a GitHub issue uh, for trouble installing on my Mac. Um, and I think he offered some helpful suggestions to the creator, but I have, still haven't figured it out yet. Um, in case you wanna, anyone wants to help me debug that issue, figure out any additional problems I might have, um, you can check that out. <laughs> but if I were to successfully install Shiny Cannon, I would open up my terminal. Um, and then I would input this into my terminal, which is just this code. And so the recording log would be the file I just created and showed you earlier, um, as well as the same link. And then I would specify a couple of other arguments. So the number of workers I want to simulate. So in this case, it could be 10. But if I was expecting to have a lot of people use my app, I could simulate 1,000 if I wanted to. And then the next is the loaded duration, so how long you want the sessions to be. And then lastly, the file name and the output directory you want to save it to. And so in this case, they want to name the file run one. So once they run Shiny Cannon, um, you'll see output that looks like this. And so it'll just tell you exactly what it's doing. And then once all of that's done, um, it'll be saved as a file, in this case, run one. And then using the shiny load test package again, we can load the runs, store them um, in a data frame, and then generate a shiny load test report. Um, and in this case, it produces this nice image in which each um, row or line here corresponds to one user. So in this case, we have two, four, six, eight, 10, or around 12-ish users, yeah, we have 12 sessions. Um, and the slowest one took around twice as long to play um, as for, I mean, I took this from another image, ignore this caption. Um, but anyways, this tells us how long um, it took to run through the, each of these users. Um, so the first section is the home page, then loading a lot of the JS and CSS code, and then the start of this, starting up the session, and then the calculate, I would say is the most important um, because these are all of the computations for the actual Shiny app. So in our example, it'd be like um, recalculating the number of histogram bins in that app. Um, so we wanna make sure, um, or this is where we can identify which users were taking the longest and why. Um, so we can just look at that because the x-axis is the amount of time it took. And depending on your app, um, you can determine what's too long and what isn't um, based on the number of users you have. Um, does that make sense? Are there any questions about that? No questions are clear. Okay, cool. So the next section is profiling. Um, and this is where we really get to identify the app or where the app is slow and memory hungry. So we already got a brief idea of that with the report, um, but now we get to see the level of each individual function in the server, um, what's taking a long time. Um, so the tools for this are with the profviz package and this produces a call stack and a flame graph, and we'll go over what exactly that is. The first step is to generate an example. So we'll load the profviz package, and we'll generate this sort of complicated set of functions, but this will be a nice example from the textbook because it gets nicely illustrate all the features of the flame graph. So the first is an F function that pauses for 0.2 seconds. Um, then it calls a G and H function, and then 10. Um, and then the G function um, pauses, calls H, and the H function just pauses for 0.3 seconds. So this is a lot to keep in your mind because it's all nested like one within another. Um, so it's helpful to one, put it into words, and then we'll visualize it. Um, so first we start with F, right? 
and then f calls g. And then now that we've called g, g calls h, which runs, which pauses for 0.3 seconds. And then the last part is for f to call h. And then it calls h again, which pauses for another 0.3 seconds. Um, and that's better illustrated here, um, which is just exactly what I walked through, but um, in visual form. So f, then f, then g, um, et cetera. And so as we've learned um, in previous chapters, this is just a call stack, um, which is a um, calling or a record of like all of the functions that you called. Um, and we put a rectangle around each function. And so the first step into our flame graph or producing it is to take this image and shove it on its side or um, rotate it 90 degrees. And so it'll look like this instead where the x-axis is like going along through time. Um, and this is because flame graphs are just drawn um, left to right. And next, um, we're gonna adjust the width um, so that the width is now proportional to the amount of time um, each function takes. And so as you can see, each, each column, um, I think represents 0 0.1 seconds because- um, uh, Sorry, Ben, I have a question. Yeah. Um, is it possible for you to explain the calling of the functions? I, I think I'm a bit lost. So we'll, the f calls g and then g calls h. So does this means that h is the one that is starting or which is starting? Um, what do you mean by which is starting? Like, yeah. I, I mean, which function is being executed first? So is it the h function, the g function or the f function? Um, so like the posing, yeah. so we start with the H is posing at 0.3 seconds. Mm -hmm. And uh, when G runs, G run calls H. Mm -hmm. So but F, F runs, F calls G and H. Mm -hmm. is, right. is that correct? <laughs> yeah, so if I understand you correctly, um, mm -hmm. the order in which um, they run is... Yes. Um, yeah, it, it is um, illustrated best in words here. Um, so F would be called first, and then G, um, then G, which then H, um, and then F lastly calls H again. Um, it, I would say it's a bit hard to demonstrate in words. Um, maybe it just takes some time to look through um, the graph or understand the logic and flow of it. Um, okay. But yeah, sir, I feel like there could be a more intuitive way to break down exactly um, which functions are called first in the order. Um, but at least for me, it just took reading it over a couple more times. So, but I see where you're coming from if I got your question, because it's not like this really, it kind of makes the order more confusing, if anything. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll have a read again to understand the fun, how, what, how, which function has been called fast. Yeah, yeah. Um, for me personally, because it did take me a bit of time, it was just reading it in words. Um, the visualization, this is just to teach what the flame graph is, but I found this helpful. Um, and then trying to see how it maps onto this. Yeah. So I'll just put this in the chat. Um, yeah, sorry, I couldn't be more helpful, but good question. It is a bit unintuitive. Um, okay. So, but even um, without ex understanding the exact order, um, we can still get a good idea of the flame graph because um, it tells you how much time at the end of the day all of this took. And so um, H takes around 0.3 seconds or exactly 0.3 seconds, which is why um, there are three columns here. And so the last part, now that we've mapped out how long um, each function takes overall, um, we just fill it in with um, flame colors. Um, so that makes it officially a flame graph, although we can work with it um, when it's not colored as well. Um, and so to get this um, flame graph in R, which actually isn't colored, I believe, um, we just call the prof is function on our function. So in this case, it's f. And I'll produce something that looks like this. So exactly what we described, except you now see these small blocks where it says pause on top. And this is because 
um, the R profiler, it pauses or it stops execution around every 10 milliseconds um, to record the call stack. Um, so the consequence of this is that we can't always stop at exactly the time we want. So, so maybe there's a certain function at a certain time maybe that we want to record, um, but we can't because R might be in the middle of something that can't be interrupted. Um, and this will depend on the individual function or app. Um, this means that results are subject to a small amount of random variation. So if we were to reprofile this code, we get a slightly different result or output because it would pause at slightly different times. Kind of in, the sim in a similar way, if you're like generating random numbers um, from a normal distribution, if your sample is large enough, it'll still look like a normal distribution, um, but the results will be slightly different unless you set a seed, of course. Um, yeah. So we'll demonstrate this with a Shiny app or what the code would look like. So here's a Shiny app we might have. Um, and then what we want to do, what's different if we want to profile it is that instead of just um, running this function, um, we want to store it. We want to store it inside an object. In this case, we'll call it app. And then we'll run the profis function, not just wrap it around the app, but around the shiny run app function. And then it'll give us um, a graph like this. OK, so some limitations of this, um, I kind of hinted at it earlier. So it randomly stops in order to profile it, but it can't always stop a process. Um, particularly when it's a C function, it can in some cases, um, but in other cases, it can't stop to inspect the process if it's a C function. And also note that data downloads can't be tracked either. So if your app involves you downloading a data set, um, this can't be profiled, um, which may be relevant, um, especially if it's a large data set and that's something, a bottleneck you want to identify, but just something to be aware of. And that's a limitation of it. All right. So the next section we have is optimization. Um, and this is where we'll go into caching, um, which we covered in an earlier chapter, right? Or at the very least, most of us are familiar with the concept of caching or saving a value for later. Um, I mean, software engineers will probably hound me for saying this, but like similar to um, a reactive value in the sense that um, it makes things a little faster um, and it records the inputs and outputs from every call to a function. So when the cache function is called with a set of inputs that's already seen, it can replay the recorded output without recomputing. Um, so for example, let's say I were to use a Shiny app on the first user and I were to input values of 10, 5, and 20. Um, let's say I want to generate a simulation, and these were the parameters I want to input. Um, or let's make it more concrete. I want to generate a normal distribution. I put a mean of 5 and a standard deviation of 2. Um, R will cache that, and then a second user might come and input the same values, 5 and 2, but it won't need to recompute and regenerate that normal distribution. It'll just give the output that it previously generated for the first user. And so that'll make things much faster. Um, and we can utilize caching with the memoirs package. Um, actually, I'll just quickly put that in the chat as well, if you want to check that out more. And you want to utilize caching. Um, and specifically the find cache function. Um, so you can cache any reactive value or render function. Um, we'll go through the concepts um, shortly in more detail of what are cache keys. So these are values that are used to see if a computation has been seen before. Again, they'll hopefully be more concrete in an example. Um, we'll talk about how um, these results or caching can be um, time dependent. Um, there's a fixed size, so you can only save so much, like you can't save a terabyte worth of um, memory, but um, in most cases that's not necessary either, so that's fine. And then the scope, um, again, that we'll discuss in more detail later, but that's just for a particular 
user session or whether it's cached for all users, that sort of thing. Um, but to make all of this concrete and go through our example, um, we'll look at this function. Um, so we create some sort of whatever function this is that requires input from X and Y. And to cache it, we just use the bind cache function afterwards after our pipe operator. So in this case, um, the keys are the inputs of X and Y. Um, and then for our next function, um, the key will be Z. So then um, another example um, will be, so for this one, um, oh yeah, this one was for um, from the textbook in which the example they used was to um, scrape data from a web API, I believe. Um, so this is where, um, even if it's very fast, it's very useful to cache this type of data because um, you don't want to every time have your server, your app have to retrieve data from a website. I mean, that can take a lot of time um, or it can quickly add up if you have a lot of users and your server has to constantly take data from the web. Um, rather, you might want to just have it saved um, like on your server or on your process. Um, so that's what this code demonstrates. Um, it's taking um, data from a website, it looks like, um, or from a web API. It's utilizing a web API and then storing this into a data frame, into a table. Um, and then we can turn this into a Shiny app, um, which is done here. And next, um, we can revise our server function, which looks like it outputs a table. Um, and we can cache the results. So again, just after your usual, the functions you want to cache, you just put a pipe operator, then the bind cache operator. Um, and so again, I, I, I walked through an example earlier, but what this does is if it's seen your username before, um, it can pull up the data much more quickly. Um, and we also use the sys.date function here um, just because um, we might want to cache the value for like, say, 24 hours, right? We don't want to cache it forever, especially if you want updated values. Like maybe, um, let's say in this example, you're pulling from the website, but the website now has a new data set. You don't want to have the same value saved from a year ago. Um, so this makes sure that um, it caches it, but only for a certain period of time. So you want to make sure to include this argument if that's relevant to you. Um, and yeah, so another thing to um, be aware of is for cache and plots, this can get a bit tricky or at least more nuanced um, because each plot is drawn in a variety of sizes. Um, and because the default plot occupies the entire width of your browser, um, which varies as you resize the browser, um, that can be a problem for caching the plots because if the width is now different, it'll have to generate a new set of values, if that makes sense. So that flexibility won't work very well for caching because even a single pixel difference in the size would mean that the plot couldn't be retrieved from the cache, right? It would have to be sort of regenerated as it were. So just be aware of that. Um, I believe, um, the bind cache function, um, yeah, I mean, you can still use it and it'll still work for plots. It's just that um, it's not as flexible. Um, and we'll go through what the cache scope is. And so we can, so as you can probably um, guess from the word scope, it's sort of the range at which this cache will apply. So does it apply to just a single user or does it apply to all users, for, for example? Um, or to say that again more precisely, does it apply for just a single session um, or does it apply for all users? Um, for example, um, it could cache values for just a single user. Um, so if I were to type in a function, it'll cache it, then I were to come back to my computer and use it again, then it'll be saved. Um, or, and I think this is the real advantage of caching, um, I could type in 
um, some specific value into the Shiny app, and then if someone across the world uses the app um, and they input the same value, R will be able to use the cached value that I inputted um, and give it to that user in a much faster amount of time. Um, does that make sense? Um, yeah, so that can be an advantage. However, we can, in our bind cache function, restrict it to just for a single session, for a single user. And this can be helpful um, to have a separate cache for each user in case the data is um, private or confidential. Um, and so this helps with the um, data privacy aspect of things, as was discussed um, in a previous week, I think. Um, however, this also um, isn't doesn't defeat the purpose of caching, but um, it doesn't really utilize it in you can't really take full advantage of it, I guess, um, if other people can't take advantage of values that were seen before by another user. Um, you can also use um, cache mem um, or cache disk to change the default cache across the whole app. Um, so you can um, use it to make a cache that's shared across multiple processes and lasts even after the app restarts is what um, these functions are for. I have to admit, I can't, I haven't read the documentation, so I can't tell you much beyond that, but um, I linked to the memoirs package, so that can be something, that can be homework you do on your own time. Um, and uh, yeah, exactly. I anticipated my next point. The book recommends you look at the bind cache documentation because I believe um, there are quite a few features and these are just a few that we touched on. So would recommend doing that. All right, we're over halfway through. Um, are there any questions, things I can go over again? Anything like that? Um, if not, and uh, no, uh, this makes make so much sense. Thank you. All right, perfect. So now we'll go into um, other optimizations. And so one thing we learned, and the most important thing I think in this chapter for optimizing is caching. Um, I mean, I guess that's subjective because there are some other suggestions here. Um, so there are ways to, um, they call it scheduled data munging, which is an interesting subtitle. Um, but really, um, when you look at their suggestions, ways to make um, functions that run faster when handling your data. So if you're handling a flat file, so it's just a two-dimensional um, data table or um, database, so most data files that you have, um, to use data.tables fread function or the room function instead, because these tend to be much faster than the read CSV and read table. Um, and if you have a data frame, try saving it with um, the write feather function from Arrow. Um, I've never, honestly, I've never used any of these before. So I'll, I'll, I can start implementing it myself in just my regular R code um, and reading with um, read feather. So feather is a binary file format um, that's much faster for read and write. Um, especially if you're working with larger data sets. Um, and if you have objects that aren't data frames, try using um, QRead and QSAVE instead of read RDS or save RDS when saving your R objects from your environment. Um, so again, something I can start implementing myself. Um, and the last sort of trick um, is to... Um, Sorry, Brendan, is it possible for you to copy the, the functions, the arrow and QS reads, sorry, the QS function on chat? Yeah, sure. Please. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just do these last few. And then... Thank you. Yeah, no worries. All right, so the last um, sort of trick or hack I'll say is to manage user expectations. So this isn't um, optimizing code on the server or backend, um, but these are a couple of nice ways of managing user expectations, which is also very important. So 
This can involve splitting your app into tabs using the tab set panel. Um, so only outputs on the current tab are recomputed. So you can use this to focus computation on what the user is currently looking at. And so while they're waiting, they could go to another tab or something else like that. Um, you could require a button to press start for a long running operation. So once the operation starts, um, you can let the user know what's happening. And if possible, display an incremental progress bar because there's evidence that progress bars make operations feel faster. They're very least more tolerable when you get to see how far along you are. Um, that's one reason I like to keep these um, keep this part open so you can see how far we are to the end um, or how close we are. So just things like that. Um, and if the app requires significant work to happen on startup and you can't reduce it with pre-processing, um, make sure to design your app so that the UI can still appear and you can let your user know that they'll need to wait. Um, so just telling them that um, either your data is loading or how long it typically takes, that sort of thing. A um, Couple more tips um, from the previous presenter is, um, you know, do a lot of your prep outside of the server where possible, um, to even do it outside of Shiny um, and use the fastest import methods possible as we discussed earlier up here. Um, only do the slow stuff if requested, which is uh, a good tip. See if all of the functions that you're running really are necessary. Um, and if, um, if they are for most users, um, make it something additional that they can request um, and learn async programming. Um, I'm not exactly sure how different it is um, from like <laughs> synchronous programming or what we've been doing, um, but another skill set to add. Um, for sure, for large scale shiny apps. Um, and the last tab are resources. So all of these are resources that are um, that were linked throughout the chapter. Um, yeah, I'll just paste all of them here so you can have them all in one place. Um, you don't have to go through all of them, I don't think, but definitely pick and choose the ones that you think will be relevant, especially if it's to help you understand a concept better, whether it's caching or um, something else, or a case study. Like for example, um, Joe Chang has a nice example um, of how to utilize um, the test that package, as well as a couple of other things, I think, to see how fast or efficient your Shiny app is, or run unit tests. I, I actually haven't watched this presentation in a while, but it was helpful when I started out. Um, but yeah, those are all the links you can check out. Um, and then lastly, um, just to see it, um, you can ask yourself if you're able to answer all of these questions. Um, if not, um, then you can either watch this recording again and go back, um, or if you felt I just did a terrible job, <laughs> read the relevant parts of the chapter, that'll work too. Um, either way, um, hope you learned one or two things here today um, and throughout this book club. And the previous cohorts are also here if you're interested. Um, so yeah, it's been almost a year, but I guess that's the end. Wow. Um, and yeah. also, yeah, if there are any other questions, feel free to let me know. Uh, thank you so much, Brendan. Uh, yes, we started in April. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay, so not it's... a year, but almost a year. <laughs> No, it's it's actually it's it's been like the better part of what I've been doing every Saturday. Every Saturday <laughs> at a specific time, I knew that I can't do anything in the morning before right. the book club. Like I, I after the book club, then I can do something. But before, otherwise, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You became part of your life now. It's, a, it's yes. over. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, I, and now it is, and um. Yeah, it, it's, uh, and above all, it's also been quite interesting interacting with uh, you, Olu, and uh, the, um, and Ryan and the rest who have been joining us through the session. So it's it's been quite, it's, it's been quite a nice journey <laughs> all our logs from building our very first journey up to, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Yes, uh, do you intend to participate in any book clubs? Definitely, I think. The school year has been a bit hectic, so I'm going to wait maybe till the <laughs> next year in the summer. Um, but yeah, we'll definitely still be involved with the our community. How about you? 
Uh, yes, I, I, I'm still involved with the art community, but in terms of um, my commitment in studying a book uh, till the beginning to the end, I want to put a pause on, on that. I, I first of all finish school. I, I think juggling between school and work, it's really taking a uh, yeah, better part of my time. <laughs> Okay. So it will make sense to be productive in a book club after at least one thing is over. So after my master's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, definitely. Yes. Understand. So that, that means 2024. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that means from 2024, yes. Mm -hmm. ah, okay. Okay. A couple of years, not too long. Yeah. Um, nice. I'm sure the community will still be here. Um, oh, yes. yes they, <laughs> they'll never go away. They will always be, there's always, there'll always be someone else who wants to read a book that you'd wish to read. Right, yeah. And it only it, mm -hmm. yeah, it only takes two people to make a discussion work. It's like two two people to discuss because you can't really discuss it yourself. So at least two people can make a discussion. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's what we've been doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and thank you for leading this book club. This is great. Um, yeah, very informative. And yeah, enjoyed meeting you, Ryan, and everyone else in Oli. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you have Twitter. I know it's supposedly dying. I'll put this in the chat for anyone that wants to follow after as well. Um, just because. Yes. I feel like, wait, what do you mean Twitter is dying? I mean, su supposedly a lot of people are leaving Twitter for like Mastodon, um, which is a new, <gasps> yeah. But I, wait, I've, I've I've seen that, and I, I wondered what was that, but I, I wasn't curious enough to follow it up. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, basically, when Elon Musk bought Twitter, yeah, um, he made some changes and wasn't uh, the nicest to his to a lot of the Twitter staff. So a lot of them walked out, and so a lot of people want to switch platforms now. Okay, yeah. okay, no, that makes sense. I, 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 I barely, I, I barely look at social media, but I will definitely give you a follow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you want, just because I know it's a good idea to network and keep in touch, and so yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I I am a, one of the people who interviewed me. I I met him in a art community in an art meetup. Oh, so the, the the world is very uh, it's <laughs> it's it's quite uh, things work in a mysterious way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One day, one time, I may be working in a project that you're working on. So yeah, it it makes sense. Networking is very important. Yeah. That's true. We might be future colleagues. For sure, for sure. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you so much, Brendan, for, for leading this chapter. And I want to appreciate anyone who has joined uh, this the, the different sessions that you have had uh, since the beginning of this year. And also anyone who has presented, I, I, I know it's volunteering and it's that you have to set time aside for you to be able to start that chapter and lead it. So we I, I seriously don't take that for granted and I truly appreciate it. and uh, yeah this community will always be here and it will always make you feel at home <laughs> knowing that yes there's someone else you can study with something that you it's of interest to you so uh yes I wish you good good luck in your studies and we'll keep in touch uh via Slack and Twitter <laughs> thanks you as well I'll see you around thanks Lisa. yes okay bye have a uh, good day yeah, you too.